This is a poem that Crowley wrote, published in the Equinox about 1910 or 11. It is called Long Odds. How many million galaxies there are, who knows? And each has countless stars in it, and each rolls through eternities afar beneath the threshold of the infinite. How is it that with all that space to roam, I should have found this moat that spins and leaps in what unutterable sunlight, foam of what unfathomable starry deeps? Who knows? And how this thousand million souls and half a thousand million souls of earth that swarm, all bound for unimagined goals, all pioneers of death enrolled at birth, how were they swept away before my sight, that I might stand upon the single prick of infinite space and time as finite? Who knows? Yet here I stand, climacteric, Having found you, was it by fall of chance? Then what a stake against what odds I have won? Was it determined in God's ordinance? Then wondrous love and pity for his son? Or was it part of an eternal law? Then how ineffably beneficent. Each thought excites an ecstasy of awe a rapture rending the mind's firmament. Infinity, yet you and I have met. Eternity, yet hand in hand we run. All odds that I should lose you or forget, but soul and spirit and body, we are one. Is this the child of chance, or law, or will? Is none or all, or one to thank for this? It will not matter if thanksgiving fill the endless Empyrean with a kiss. This is an excerpt from The Book of Lies written about 1910 or 11 by Alistair Crowley. It is called Venus of Milo. Life is as ugly and necessary as the female body. Death is as beautiful and necessary as the male body. The soul is beyond male and female as it is beyond life and death. Even as the lingam and the yoni are but diverse developments of one organ, so also are life and death but two phases of one state. So also the absolute and the conditioned are but forms of that. What do I love? There is no form, no being, to which I do not give myself wholly up. Take me who will. In the sixth volume of the Equinox, Alistair Crowley wrote and published a prose poem called The Earth. This is a short excerpt from it. The child of miracle to the world, greeting. I reach my hands to the leaves and dabble in the dew. I sprinkle dew on you for kisses. I kneel down and hold the grass of the black earth to my bosom. I crush the earth to my lips as if it were a grape and the wine of Demeter flushes my cheeks. They burn with joy of youth. Why should I greet the world? Because my heart is bursting with love for the world. Love, say I? Why not lust? Is not lust strength and merriment and the famine that only the infinite can stay? And why do I call myself the child of miracle? because I have entered a second time into my mother's womb and am born. Because to the knowledge of manhood has come the passion, even the folly of adolescence, with all its pride and purity. 
It is for this that you see me lying upon the thick, wet grass, unquenchable, or rejoicing in the fat, black loam. Now, the manner of the miracle was this. In the beginning is given to a youth the vision of his mate. This one must he henceforth seek blindly. And many are the enchantments and disenchantments. Through this his vision fades. Even his hunger dies away, unless he be indeed elect. But in the end it may be that God shall send him the other half of that token of paradise. Then, if he have kept the holy fire alight, perhaps with much false fuel, that fire shall instant blaze and fill the temple of his soul. By its insistent energy, it shall destroy even the memory of all those martial lights that came to greet it. And the priest shall bow down in glory and grasp the altar with his hands and strike it with his forehead seven times. Now this altar is the earthen altar of Demeter. This is from the Book of Wisdom or Folly. My son, there are afflictions many and woes many that come of the errors of men in respect of the will. But there is none greater than this, the interference of the busybody. For they make pretense to know a man's thought better than he doth himself and to direct his will with more wisdom than he, and to make plans for his happiness. And of all these, the worst is he that sacrifices himself for the weal of his fellows. He that is so foolish as not to follow his own will, how shall he be so wise as to pursue that of another? If mine horse balk at a fence, should some varlet come behind him and strike at his hoofs? Nay, son, pursue thy path in peace, that thy brother beholding thee may take courage from thy bearing and comfort from his confidence that thou wilt not hinder him by thy superfluity of compassion. Let me not begin to tell thee of the mischiefs that I have seen whose root was in kindness, whose flower was in self-sacrifice, and whose fruit in catastrophe. Verily, I think there should be no end thereof. Strike, rob, slay thy neighbor, but comfort him not, unless he ask it of thee. And if he ask it, be wary. This is part of an essay written in the Blue Equinox and is called The Rights of Property. I have no sympathy with those who cry out against property, as if what all men desire were of necessity evil. The natural instinct of every man is to own, and while man remains in this mood, attempts to destroy property, must not only be nugatory, but deleterious to the community. There is no outcry against the rights of property where wisdom and kindness administer it. The average man is not so unreasonable as the demagogue for his own selfish ends pretends to be. The great nobles of all time have usually been able to create a happy family of their dependents, and unflinching loyalty and devotion have been their reward. The secret has been principally this, that they have considered themselves noble as well in nature as in name, and thought it foul shame to themselves if any retainer met unnecessary misfortune. The upstart of today, however, lacks this feeling. 
he must try constantly to prove his superiority by exhibiting his power. And harshness is his only weapon. This is from a little book called The Book of Lies, The Smoking Dog, Oshia Kifum. Each act of man is the twist and double of an hair. Love and death are the greyhounds that cause him. God bred the hounds and taketh his pleasure in the sport. This is the comedy of Pan that man should think he hunteth, while those hounds hunt him. This is the tragedy of man when facing love and death he turns to bay. He is no more hare but boar. There are no other comedies or tragedies. Cease then to be the mockery of God. In savagery of love and death live thou and die. Thus shall his laughter be thrilled through with ecstasy. This is an excerpt from Liber Aleph, the Book of Wisdom or Folly. Behold now nature, how prodigal is she of her forces. The evident will of every acorn is to become an oak yet nigh all fail of that will. Therefore one secret of magic is economy of thy force, to do no act unless secure of its effect. And if every act hath an effect on every plane, how canst thou do this unless thou be connected with all planes? For this reason must thou know thoroughly not only thy body and thy mind, but thy body of light, and all its subtler principles soever. But I will have thee to consider most especially what powers thou hast within thee, which are certainly capable of great effects, which are constantly wasted. Think then whether, if these powers, frustrate of their end upon one plane, might not be turned to high purpose and assured success upon another. For an hundred acorns, rightly set in conditions fit for their true growth, will become an hundred oaks, while otherwise they make but one meal for one hog, and their subtle nature is wholly lost to them. Learn then, O oh my son, this mystery of economy, and apply it faithfully and with diligence in thy work. The Tent This is a sonnet that Crowley wrote during a trip to the desert. Only the stars endome the lonely camp. Only the desert leagues encompass it. Waterless wastes a wilderness of wit, embattled cold, imagination's cramp. Now were the desolation fain to stamp the congealed spirit of man into the pit, save that, unquenchable because unlit, the love of God burns steady like a lamp. It burns beyond the sands, beyond the stars. It burns beyond the bands, beyond the bars, and so the expanse of mystery, veil by veil, burns inward, plume on plume, still folding over the dissolved heart of the amazed lover, the angel wings over the holy grail. The following is an excerpt from a letter he wrote to one of his inquirers relative to the meaning of some of the magical instruments. Really, you comfort me when you turn from those abstruse and exalted themes with which you have belaboured me so often of late 
to dare cuddle some little questions like this in our letter received this morning. Do please, dear Master, give me some hints about how to make talismans. That's the same as talismata, isn't it? Yes. And the pantacle. The official instructions are quite clear, of course, but somehow I find them just a little frightening. Well, I think I know pretty well what you mean. So I will try to imitate the style of Aunt Tabitha in the flapper's fireside. For one thing, you forgot to mention the laman. Now, what are these things when they are at home? That's easy enough. The laman is a sort of coat of arms. It expresses the character and powers of the wearer. A talisman is a storehouse for some particular kind of energy, the kind that is needed to accomplish the task for which you have constructed it. The pantacle is often confused with both the others. Accurately, it is a minutum mundum, the universe in little. It is a map of all that exists arranged in the order of nature. There is a chapter in Book 4, Part 2 devoted to it. I cannot make up my mind whether I like it. At the best, it is very far from being practical instruction. An analogy, not too silly for these three, the chess player, the openings, and the game itself. Jean. I laid mine ear against your heart, Jean. A masterpiece of nature turned a masterpiece of art. With your blanched Egyptian beauty foiled by the hungry eyes and the red mouth soiled by the honey of mine that your green has spoiled, Jean. The body a corpse and the soul in urn. Against your heart I laid mine ear, Jean, and the clock went ticking, ticking. How could I choose but hear, Jean? Ah, me, what thoughts came pricking like spurs in the flanks of a weary horse? Nor heart nor clock could feel remorse, but kept their definite deadly course, Jean. Alas for man, for his life's disaster. The clock beats fast, but a heart beats faster. Oh, your love was a marvelous thing, Jean. It was dawn, it was fire, it was birth, it was spring, Jean. But this is the curse, that it quickens its rate, lest man, by love, should escape from fate and win from the dust to the uncreate, Jean. Nay, we are lovers, you and I, and we must die, and our love must die. We love, we shall die, sweetheart. Take cheer, Jean. We are bound to a fate that brings release. We move in a moil that must one day cease. We shall win to the everlasting peace, Jean. And how things are, and why, and whence, are puzzles for fools that lack the sense of cows. Enough of the future tense, Jean. For the end of love and the end of art is just my ear against your heart.